Thank you. Uh, by remaining in this session, you are agreeing to be recorded. If you do not want to be recorded, you can turn off your camera and your microphone, or you can leave the session and request a copy of the recording afterwards. So we are now recording. Today's presentation is OER and library resources. My name is Lauren Woodman, and I'm an instructional designer with online learning. I'm joined by Dev Alborelli, who's the online learning and information services librarian. For the long title. <laughs> For those of you who haven't attended any of our presentations in the past, we are very laid back and open. So feel free to type any questions in the chat and I will answer them as we go, or I'll let you know if I'll address it at the end. I just ask that you mute yourself if you're not speaking, but feel free to unmute and interrupt at any time if you have a question or if you have something to add. I also wanna let you know that we're offering a certificate or a badge for completion of this training. It's a new system we just started using called Badger. So stay tuned to the end of the training and you'll receive a QR code or a link to claim your badge. So you signed up for this training and it said OER and it's higher ed, we love acronyms, right? So what does OER stand for? So OER stands for Open Educational Resources which is still a bit vague. So let's drill it down. Open educational resources are high quality educational materials that are openly licensed. This means that you can share them with your students for free. And in many cases, you can personalize them or adapt the content. Unlike materials that come from a publisher like Pearson or McGraw-Hill or Cengage that are copyrighted or all rights reserved, Open educational resources are usually either available in the public domain or they're licensed through Creative Commons. And depending on the Creative Commons license that's used, you can either just share the content with your students um, or you can even edit and change the content to be your own. And I want to make an important note that I said OER is high quality and it generally is high quality and often peer reviewed content. There seems to be this common misconception that free means low quality, um, but as OER becomes more popular, there are more and more great high quality options available. So I want to quickly discuss Creative Commons and the differences between licenses. Um, I know that this might be a bit difficult to read. There is a link at the end of this presentation that has um, links to where you can find this and many other guides. So this just explains a little bit about Creative Commons. Creative Commons is a global nonprofit organization that is dedicated to supporting an open and accessible internet that is enriched with free knowledge and creative resources for people around the world to use, share, and cultivate. Creative Commons licenses provide a simple, standardized way to give the public permission to share and use creative works on the conditions of the author's choosing. So like I said before, sometimes that means you can do whatever you want with that content. Sometimes it's a little bit more locked down. Creative Commons licenses let you change your copyright terms from the default, which is all rights reserved copyright to some rights reserved. When you use a Creative Commons license to share your photos or videos or articles, your creation joins a globally accessible pool of resources that includes the works of many other artists and educators uh, and scientists and members of the government. So there are a few different conditions that apply to a Creative Commons license, and they are first attribution. So all Creative Commons licenses require that anyone who uses your work in any way gives you credit. Uh, but it doesn't mean that you endorse them or that you like you know, gave them a sticker seal of approval. It just means that they have to give you credit and say, hey, I got this from Dev. The second one is share alike. And that lets others copy and distribute and display and modify your work as long as they distribute that in the same way. So you can't take someone's free work, change it, and then copyright it, right? You have to allow it to be shared as openly as that person shared it with you. If they want to modify that, those terms, they have to get your permission first. The third condition is no derivatives. 
when that means that you would let others copy and distribute and display your work, but only the original. They can't modify it, they can't edit it, it can't be changed. If they want to modify it, they have to get your permission first. And lastly is non-commercial. So you would let anyone copy or distribute your work unless you've chosen no derivatives, um, you know, they can modify it. And they can use that work for any purpose as long as it's not commercial. And that's really kind of, I don't wanna say, it's not really pertinent to what we are uh, thinking in education because most of what we are doing is non-commercial. Uh, but just think if you're putting this on your website that you are making a profit from, you wanna be careful and make sure that that OER content is um, marketed for non-commercial work as well. And if you note, um, these get more restrictive as they go down. So with just attribution, um, anything goes, right? If you, you just have to say where you got it, you can change it, you can modify it, you can share it, you can use it commercially. It's kind of a free for all, just say where you got the original from. Um, um, sorry, <laughs> I lost my place. Um, but as you go down, you know, you can have something that is very restrictive that you can't use for commercial use, you can't modify at all, um, and you have to share very widely, um, as widely as the person who, who shared it with you. Um, I see Ali has a question. Share alike and no derivatives sound like the opposite. So with share alike, you are required to use the same licensing as the person who shared it with you. So it's really like, um, I, Ali, I'm saying that people can modify this work. So if you're using it, you have to let people modify this work. It's really like, just make sure you're using the same or less restrictive options. Um, you just can't be more restrictive. No derivatives just means you can't make any changes to that work. Um, you can still do share alike and no derivatives. So I can still say, I shared it, so you have to share it. Um, I said no changes, you can't allow changes. And I hope that helps a little bit. If you look on the right here, you can see the different licenses and kind of how they might combine to tell you what those usage restrictions are for any given work. And you see here some of those comb combinations. So attribution and no derivatives, attribution and non-commercial, um, you know, share alike and non-commercial. So you can see kind of how those might work together. Um, and this is actually licensed, this guide is licensed under a, um, an interesting copyright because this is a CC0 public domain um, attribution or, or license. So basically anybody can, can use this as in the public domain and uh, that is another type of license. So one of the biggest draws to using OER is that it's free for students. But why else does OER matter? how can using open resources help our students? Here's what the research says. So OER can help increase success rates. At the University of Georgia, researchers found that access to an open textbook on the first day of class improved end of course grades and decreased the rates of uh, DF and withdrawal for all students and for Pell Grant recipients most extensively. OER can also help increase enrollment. So another study found that students were more likely to enroll in courses that had zero textbook costs than courses that use traditional te textbooks, and that students rated instructors more positively when OER was used, which is not surprising, right, because they were probably saving money. And of course, we know that OER can decrease cost, and that's a big one. At Tidewater Community College, Community College Reacher researchers showed a 25% decrease in student cost to graduate um, through the college's zero cost degree program compared to traditional programs where proprietary texts were used. And you think about that 25% decrease, we know that students are already paying in some cases at some schools, right, exorbitant amounts of money on tuition. Here at Northampton, you know, our tuition is modest, but it's still an expense for students. 
So if they can graduate with 25% less debt, um, that's a great service that we could do to students. I'm going to highlight just a few resources for open content. I'm not gonna read all of these to you and I'm not even going to click on them because honestly, they're just websites that you can explore. I will give you all a copy of this presentation afterwards so you can click on all of the links and, and go through them. Um, but there are a few different types of sites that house open educational resources and open content. So the first at a high level are these aggregated OER collections. And some of those are OER Commons, Merlot, and the Mason OER MetaFinder. So these are great if you're looking for open content for your course, but you don't really know what you want. So for example, if you wanna find like an open book or an article related to developmental psychology, an aggregated search tool is a great option because these search many different resources and they return all of the search results to you. Mason OER MetaFinder is the best in my opinion because it also searches OER Commons and Merlot. It's kind of like the Google search of OER. There are also, also open data collections where you can find data and statistics like data.gov and the uh, World Bank Open Data. For open textbooks, there are many great options. Uh, like OpenStax, Open SUNY Textbooks, Open Textbook Library. These sites include texts across many different disciplines, and some of them are currently in use here at NCC. For example, the OpenStax sociology text is in use and the physics text. And in the past, we've used the history text and the psychology text as well. So again, these are peer-reviewed textbooks. They come with uh, different resources. They're available online. They are free for students. Um, and they are often updated. So the sociology text just received an update to a new edition. Uh, Libre Text is a great platform that not only includes many open textbooks, so it has all of the textbooks from OpenStax in it, but it also allows you to modify the textbook right within the Libre Text system. So let's say you find an English textbook in OpenStax that you like, but you want to change up a few chapters or maybe you want to take some things out because they don't pertain to your students. You can go into LibreText for free and edit that textbook um, because it allows for derivatives and then provide your students with a link to your edited version of the text. So if you want to get into kind of creating and modifying your own OER, it is a great resource. One question I get from faculty often is where can I find images or videos for my course? Well, Creative Commons site also allows you to search for images, for music, and for videos that are open, openly licensed. You can also search Library of Congress for content that's in the public domain. Dev will talk a little bit more about some of those options, um, but for Images and icons, there's Art Store, Pixabay, The Noun Project, Unsplash, and they're all great sites to find open images. I especially like Unsplash for more modern and diverse images. And Pixabay and The Noun Project are great for icons. So if you just want a cute icon to put in your course, those are great sites. I do want to touch on YouTube briefly because often people think that, oh, I can just go on YouTube and grab a video. Those are not always openly licensed. You can use them in your course. Um, you're probably not going to get in trouble for that, but just note that if that information is copywritten, it can be removed at any time by the person who owns the copyright. That link will be broken in your course and you won't have access to it. So it's a great idea to try to locate content that you know is openly licensed. Um, an example might be, um, uh, Crash Course, for example, their videos are all licensed through Creative Commons. They want educators to use them. You are allowed to use that content. Um, so just keep that in mind. Um, if for some reason you have content that you want, like a video or something that you want and you're interested in, and it's not available on YouTube, it might be available through our library. <laughs> so I'm going to let Dev talk about library resources. Thanks, Lauren. Uh, hey, everyone. My name is Dev Alborelli. I'm a librarian here at NCC. 
I'm going to talk very briefly about library licensed materials that are options for course content for everyone, in addition to the amazing OER resources that Lauren has already been discussing in some great detail. Um, library resources that I'm calling adjacent to are adjacent to OER. That's my, I don't know if I made it up, but I'd like to think I did. That's my catchphrase for the from a student's perspective, they're they're free, you know. Um, these would include for our purposes, electronic database subscriptions that would include journals and periodicals. We do have some really cool streaming video options in addition to some of the ones Lauren was just discussing. Ebooks, primary source materials, there's a bunch of audio visual material available. I, I think there's more available than people realize. Um, we've been getting more, we've, I think people are starting to realize it uh, more recently. And I just list JSTOR as a, one of our subscription databases that just happens to be my favorite as an example. So, um, some of the uh, examples of streaming video and database, can we go to the next slide? Sorry. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so some of uh, our library license materials, um, these are the, some of the, the best ones and the ones that we've been getting the most usage out of include films on demand, which is obviously um, how by the title a streaming video option, which is, it's huge. It's really cool. You can put it right into Blackboard. There's a mashup option. Uh, I can, if anyone wants, needs any assistance doing that, I would be happy. I've assisted a couple of instructors with that. I know I'm sure Lauren has assisted millions of instructors with that. Uh, the second one on, our, on the list here is called Great African American Authors. It's Ambrose Digital. It's another streaming video option. Uh, it's more specific. Uh, it's a collection about African American authors, but I listed because one of our instructors here at NCC uses it heavily, heavily in their course. And I, recently spent some time just uh, getting it together again for their Blackboard show. Canopy streaming is uh, a very, it's an awesome stream, streaming video service. It's like almost the equivalent, this is a ridiculous comparison, but I'm gonna say it. It's almost the equivalent of like academic Netflix. Um, we have we have some stuff in there. You can, if there's a video that you're looking for that you can't find, but we, you let me know or let someone at the live, let me know and I'll ask, We've been, I can't promise everybody every everything, but we have been buying individual, we've been purchasing videos for instructors to use through Canopy. It's really, it's in, it, the depth of the content is incredible. We don't obviously don't have access to all of it because it's extremely expensive, but we do, we do have it and we, we have been buying individual um, films and uh, documentaries. I can't, like I said, I don't want to, make a whole lot of grand, grandiose promises, but we're def it's definitely really cool, totally worth checking out. Then the last two, EBSCO Discovery Service. Lauren mentioned OER, Google. EBSCO Discovery Service is right on our homepage. It's, a, it's our umbrella database resource. It's like library Google, where everyone, you can search um, all of our resources at once, all the print collections at both campuses, everything we've got, you can search right through there. Uh, I, I always call it library Google. Um, I think that's a pretty apt description. And then last but not least, the last link, you know, the old fashioned way, uh, SpartaCat is our library catalog. And that basically what that means is books, which we are, uh, we've, um, the print collection we've gotten away from for the past year for obvious reasons. However, you can search both, uh, both the Monroe and Bethlehem campus libraries, everything we've got in the buildings right through SpartaCat. Um, so with that in mind, I'm gonna do a quick, uh, Quick, quick online tour of what, what we were discussing. Let me just give me one second. All right, well, oh, there it is, sorry. <laughs> All right, that's not, give me one second, sorry. It's my email. There we go, okay. So after my brief fumbling, sorry, I was just in uh, Las Vegas for a week and I, this is my literally my first day back. I didn't make enough money gambling to retire, so here we are. <laughs> but this is our homepage and some of the stuff I was mentioning. EBSCO, I apologize if all of you are very familiar with this, but really quickly, EBSCO Discovery Service, this is our umbrella search tool. And you'll notice right in the search box, books, articles, streaming, video, and more, you can search everything we've got uh, it's the most general way. It's what we recommend to the students to do first. But anyone, if you're looking for the, the most broad search, it's right here. Uh, and then if we want to go down some of the street, some of the more specific resources I mentioned, 
if you wanted to search, let's say, uh, films on demand, for example, what we want to do, go right into databases. And then I would just go over to F. Here's films on demand. I'm going to log in, just do the whole process just to show you. And this, uh, this is really, I think, totally, it's very, it's a huge resource, uh, well worth it. And then here we are, and you can see, and we can pump these videos right into uh, um, your, your Blackboard, your, black, your, your Blackboard shells. And there's a way to just mash them up. They come up, they look really nice um, when, when we do that. And you can see, without going crazy with this, just how much stuff there is here. Definitely worth checking out. Cup one, one or two other ones. Can't here it is right here. Um, this is cool too. Let's hope it opens. And you can see, I'm not gonna go through the whole, I'm not gonna just keep logging doing all these logins, but you can see this this has just a huge, huge collection, um, a lot of neat stuff. Uh, you can see moonlight. It, it does include some popular stuff. You can there's, you know, if like I said, I don't want to start promising everything, but if there's, you know, there's, it's not just uh, strictly academic, it's, you know, there's um, popular Hollywood films, a lot of them are available through here. Uh, you can see this James Baldwin film, I believe, won an Oscar, I think Moonlight won an Oscar. So it's a, it's a huge resource and we can definitely, we definitely encourage people to give that a try. Um, and then last, and then just while we're here, all of our databases, if you wanted to search anyone, I mentioned JSTOR too, all right through here. Uh, JSTOR, there's an open access, there's an, JSTOR has an open access content. Right now, I'm not sure for how much longer they're gonna do this. They've made everything. We have access, to, you know, we pay for a subscription to JSTOR. We don't, our subscription typically wouldn't cover everything that's available in their archive. It's just absolutely huge and expensive. Um, right now, they've opened it, opened it up due to COVID, so there's even more content available. I think I've, at least to the end of the year, um, I can check back, but I think for the fall semester, we would be okay using almost anything in JSTOR. And then after that, it would be more of a subscription-based thing, but we still have a ton of content available through that. And that, that um, remember that's all right through the library homepage. And then we see EBSCO, you know, we can go right to that. Here's, I'll show you, we just read Spartacus at the catalog. So in case anyone wants to see that, here are, here's the books <laughs> and we can, um, you can, obviously I'm sure everyone's well aware of this, but everything through Monroe and Bethlehem, you can search right through here for sure. And that um, covers the basics, what I was gonna, was gonna talk about. <laughs> so I'm gonna stop sharing. Thank you, Dev. Uh, Julie had a question in the chat. She'd love to hear more about what the best service to use for supporting ACE courses, early childhood education. I'm always looking to add more quality content students can access along with letting them know how to show students how to search these databases for research as well. I think for education, we have um, Eric, we have access to Eric, which is the federal, we have um, the federal government's clearinghouse. That's really amazing for um, education, educational resources, JSTOR, ProQuest, the big, the heavy hitters, um, the uh, EBSCO is called Academic Search uh, Premier. I would be happy if, if you want to, I'll put my email in the chat and if you want to go into more in depth, I, if you, we, I would be happy to discuss finding specific resources for you, uh, whether it's uh, journal articles to complement your course content. If there's some, if there, if there is streaming video you, you're interested in, I'd be happy to look and see what we have and how we can help you. And I'm going to put my email chat. Thank you. That'd be great. I know there's a couple of resources I've used in the past that I didn't think to go onto the library to look for. So now I'm definitely going to go look for them to see if I can stream them into course, yeah. or, you know, added to course arc or into any of the classes that I'm teaching too. So, yeah, let me know. Uh, feel please feel free to reach out anytime, and I'll, I'll see what uh, see what I can find for you for sure. Thank you. Sure.
Yeah, Julie, um, those videos should all have embed codes so they can all be put into Course Arc. Um, and even Canopy, I, I knew what Canopy was, but I had never taken the time to go into it. I didn't realize we had so many like modern films in there. So that's a great- Let me add a caveat to Canopy. Yes, it's, it's huge. We don't have like the overall subscription to all of those, but we, like I said, we can purchase, we've been purchasing um, individual uh, films per instructor's request. Some of it's really expensive. I, so like, I, I can't, I don't want to just say, yeah, we'll buy everything. I want, I want to say that. <laughs> I can't, I can't make, I can't say that. We're definitely interested in looking. Well, I'll definitely ask, let say the least. All right. Um, well, thank you, Dev. And um, we are close to wrapping up. Give me one moment. Um, these are some of the resources that I mentioned. Um, these are links to different guides. Um, so these quick start guides uh, for OER have some of that um, Creative Commons information that I shared earlier. The library has two LibGuides on open access and open educational resources that we will be updating uh, continually this summer. I have to get Dev some updates, <laughs> but there's already great information there on some of these sites that I mentioned. And there are live links to those slides that I showed earlier. Um, our online learning and a tech website that is also under construction, but we're adding more and more open educational resources for faculty. Um, and I have a plug here for PA Goal, which is the grant for open and, and accessible learning. Sorry, open and affordable learning. <laughs> and um, that, that grant is um, currently going and the deadline for application is July 5th and that grant provides a small sum of money to faculty who want to either adopt OER for their course for the fall or who want to develop some um, OER resources or a develop their course using existing OER. Um, I have more information about that later on in this presentation if you want to stick around afterwards. Um, if that sounds like something that you would be interested in, we can discuss further, um, but that is not definitely not required uh, part of this presentation. And as promised, <laughs> we are trying this new system called Badger. And I am going to pop this link into the chat. So, for attending this presentation, you can claim your badge. You can either click the link in the chat or scan the QR code on the page. Um, please do that now, or you can, if you know you don't have your phone handy or another screen handy, email me afterwards, and I will send you the link uh, to the to get this badge. Um, but I definitely want you to get credit. We are going to be using these badges, hopefully for most of our professional development. So you can start to accrue them. Um, and they're not just like stickers. You can share this to your LinkedIn. You can share it to Twitter. Um, you can share out a link to your, your badge portfolio. So if you want to um, keep track or share it with your supervisor or someone to say, hey, I've done these things, um, it is a, a resource for that. And while you're all doing that, um, if you are interested in Creative Commons and want to know more about the licensing and how that works, if you're considering creating your own open educational resources, um, one of our designers, Marshall, is uh, a trainer for Creative Commons. And uh, if anyone is interested, please reach out. You can say in the chat if you're interested. Um, the training for Creative Commons is about two hours, uh, but that is a, uh, a great kind of resume builder and a, a, just a great resource if it's something that you're interested in too. So can I get some thumbs up or um, any information if any of you have been able to claim your badge? You can put it in the chat to chime in. Julie, it looks like you're gonna say yes. <laughs> yes, okay, awesome. Um, now, Ali had a question that I said I would address at the end. So true to my word, I want to come back to that. Um, Ali's question was, what can an instructor do to modify a text or image for accessibility? 
One of the reasons I'm interested in OER is that few eBooks are in fact accessible to students with sensory impairments or learning differences. Can it be done? Um, and Jerry, that's fine. I will send you the link afterwards. Um, Ali, that's a great question. And it really depends. And that's why I said I'll, I'll answer it later because it's a really complex question. Um, so I work coordinating some of the accessibility for, for students who have disabilities, who have documented disability and might need um, some alteration to their content. So sometimes, let's say it's a, um, and this is a really common one, especially in English, not to pick on English, but maybe it is an old, um, a, an old article or a, um, some kind of book, but it's something someone has taken a picture of, and now it's just an image. Um, a student who uses a screen reader or a student who is blind or low vision is not going to be able to read that. There's no content for the screen reader to read. It's just going to like gloss right over it. So what I generally do, and there, there are some softwares that can help with it. Adobe Pro can help with it. There are what we call OCR scanners, which scan for uh, text in an image and we'll pull that out. Um, but sometimes I, it's faster to just retype it. And I've done some of that this semester, just retyping text out of an image because it wasn't accessible. Um, sometimes you get an ebook or any kind of article and there are images within, but the text is readable. Um, then it's a little bit of a different conversation. Sometimes that those images have what we call alt text. And to those of us, we don't see it, but a computer or a screen reader knows to read a description of that image. And sometimes that image is decorative, so it doesn't actually matter because the screen reader can read all of the text, all of the important content. Um, so it really depends what that content is. Traditionally, OER, especially the stuff that's in OpenStax or LibreText, um, anything that comes through the library, those things are checked for accessibility and we know they're going to be accessible. Um, so I don't know if that helps answer your question at all. It does, but I was kind of already aware that this is a complex situation due to the population that I often see in my classes. I've had everything from colorblindness mm -hmm. to complete deaf with a reliance on a on an interpreter, mm -hmm. and I never know what my students. I also have a lot of students with learning differences. I never know what's coming ahead, and I really don't want to try my students patience with having to do everything on the back end uh -huh. and recently the bookstore has that wonderful fallout access program where they charge the students ahead of time for textbooks uh -huh. for ebooks those ebooks are not accessible there's no read aloud there's no magnification there is no adjustment it's basically a pdf of the printed text uh -huh. and given that my i uh, learning pro learning differences and, and sensory impairments are quite likely in my classroom, particularly in the fall. I'm not comfortable with encouraging my students to join that program mm -hmm. because of that. And I have talked to the Div disabilities office and they are aware that these ebooks are not accessible. And so I was hoping I could use OER and perhaps add closed captioning um, read aloud functionality, uh, those kinds of things that my students might need. Mm -hmm. That might be like OER 4.0. I, yeah. I don't know. But, but I, I'm really hoping that somebody out there is thinking of that because we have a large population with learning differences and, and, mobile, and impairments of all sorts and community college has been the place that traditionally serves them. Um, and we have to be able to be ready to serve them if we're going to claim to be able to do that. So th that's a great point. Um, and I, you touch on a, a few things there that I want to highlight. The first one is you mentioned not wanting to frustrate students by doing this on the back end. And you mentioned universal design in your initial question. And mm -hmm. um, that, that is the way to do that. And what you're thinking is absolutely correct. You shouldn't have to adjust for these potential issues that come up. It should be accessible upfront. Um, so you know that, and that's awesome. Um, 
also there are there are a few different types of accessibility right so the the bare minimum of accessibility is is there text that can be either read or you know visually or read by a screen reader um depending on the text i haven't seen these texts it could be that okay it could be read by a screen reader although sometimes pdfs have really big issues being read by a screen reader mm -hmm. um but like you said there's no functionality you can't make it bigger you can't adjust it you can't read it aloud like that's not very useful kind of accessibility you know um there are workarounds to that type of issue so there is a product we have called read and write that is a um it's an add-on it's free we have it through the college that does screen reading it does um, it'll read aloud pdfs it'll read it to you that's also a feature available in Adobe. It's also available in Microsoft, um, all of which students have access to. Do I add that? For instance, if I have a text available, can I add that on to that text so that it's so you know just click and go? <laughs> <laughs> um, and that's it's going to depend because no, it's not really something you would add because think about the way you open something on your computer, right? Like mm -hmm. you might have three or four different programs that can open a Word document on a computer. Um, so it would be more about educating your students about like, okay, I recommend that you open this in Microsoft Word and here's how you click the read aloud button. Um, there are videos on this and you know there are different instructions that you could give, uh, but it isn't like an easy, you know, fit right in kind of solution. Um, the other thing is that depending where your textbook is coming from, depending which publisher it's from, that's going to matter too. So it sounds like the publisher doesn't have a platform that really supports ebooks very well, whereas there are some that do. That's true. Most of them don't. And mm. what really concerns me is that we have no support for them. Mm. The students have to go to a 1-800 number and wait. Yeah, and that's really problematic. And so you know, if you're committed to this text, then um, it is what it is, but there are, um, you know, then OER really isn't going to be any worse off for your students. Um, I'll look into Libre text, they might have a read aloud option. And okay. I think OpenStax might as well. So I'll look into okay. that and I can definitely get back to you. I'll put that in the message that I send to Joe as well. Um, Good to know. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, but then, yeah, looking in like McGraw Hill, for example, all of their textbooks do have those magnify options. They do have the options to read aloud. So there, that is available um, from certain publishers, but oftentimes you are paying extra for that convenience, as they call it. My best books are from Norton. Norton doesn't have any of it. Yeah, and I'd be interested. I know Norton has another uh, platform called Inquisitive. And yes, I've seen it. Yeah, I wonder. I think if the McGraw that. Hill one is better. Yeah, I would. Mm -hmm. I would say the same. Yeah, but that's a question for another time. Thank you very <laughs> much. It's, you've you've uh, answered my question sufficiently, and someday I'm going to have to sit down and invite you to lunch and talk about my specific quandary, because I get a lot of them. I get a lot of students that uh, have uh, particular adjustments that need to be made, and I want to be able to make them. So, of course. So I'm just grabbing a link to this presentation uh, so that you all have it. Okay, so um, this link to presentation is going into the chat. And Marsha, I see you were able to get your badge. Awesome. Uh, Jerry, I will email you the link afterwards. It's also going to be in the presentation, so you can click on it from there and, um, and get your badge. Um, we have a few more minutes. Uh, looks like we're scheduled till 12. So if anyone has any specific questions or wants to see a walkthrough of any of these sites or wants to look for something specific in an OER site, we're happy to assist with that. Um, I am going to stop the recording now. Sarah is going to stop the recording now. <laughs>